The Once Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka Book 1. Look at this grain. I believe that a revolution can begin from this one strand of straw. Seen at a glance, this rice straw may appear light and insignificant. Hardly anyone would believe that it could start a revolution. Nevertheless, I have come to realize the weight and power of this straw. For me, this revolution is very real. Look at these fields of rye and barley. This ripening grain will yield about 22 bushels, 1,300 pounds, per quarter acre. I believe this matches the top yields in Ehime Prefecture. If this equals the best yield in Ehime Prefecture, it could easily equal the top harvest in the whole country since this is one of the prime agricultural areas in Japan. And yet, these fields have not been ploughed for 25 years. To plant, I simply broadcast rye and barley seed on separate fields in the fall, while the rice is still standing. A few weeks later, I harvest the rice and spread the rice straw back over the fields. It is the same for the rice seeding. This winter grain will be cut around the 20th of May. About two weeks before the crop has fully matured, I broadcast rice seed over the rye and barley. After the winter, grain has been harvested and the grains threshed. I spread the rye and barley straw over the field. I suppose that using the same method to plant rice and winter grain is unique to this kind of farming. However, there is an easier way. As we walk over to the next field, let me point out that the rice there was sown last fall at the same time as the winter grain. The whole year's planting was finished in that field by New Year's Day. You might also notice that white clover and weeds are growing in these fields. Clover seed was sown among the rice plants in early October, shortly before the rye and barley. I do not worry about sowing the weeds. They reseed themselves quite easily. So the order of planting in this field is like this. In early October, clover is broadcast among the rice, winter grain then follows in the middle of the month. In early November, the rice is harvested and then the next year's rice seed is sown and straw laid across the field. The rye and barley you see in front of you were grown this way. In caring for a quarter acre field, one or two people can do all the work of growing rice and winter grain in a matter of a few days. It seems unlikely that there could be a simpler way of raising grain. This method completely contradicts modern agricultural techniques. It throws scientific knowledge and traditional farming craft right out the window. With this kind of farming, which uses no machines, no prepared fertilizer, and no chemicals, it is possible to attain a harvest equal to or greater than that of the average Japanese farm. The proof is ripening right before your eyes. Nothing at all. Recently, people have been asking me why I started farming this way so many years ago. Until now, I have never discussed this with anyone. You could say there was no way to talk about it. It was simply, how would you say it, a shock, a flash, one small experience that was the starting point. That realization completely changed my life. It is nothing you can really talk about, but it might be put something like this. Humanity knows nothing at all. There is no intrinsic value in anything, and every action is a futile, meaningless effort. This may seem preposterous, but if you put it into words, that is the only way to describe it. This thought developed suddenly in my head when I was still quite young. I did not know if this insight, that all human understanding and effort are of no account, was valid or not, but if I examined these thoughts and tried to banish them, I could come up with nothing within myself to contradict them. Only the certain belief that this was so burned within me. It is generally thought that there is nothing more splendid than human intelligence, that human beings are creatures of special value, and that their creations and accomplishments as mirrored in culture and history are wondrous to behold. That is the common belief anyway. Since what I was thinking was a denial of this, I was unable to communicate my view to anyone. Eventually, I decided to give my thoughts a form, to put them into practice, and so to determine whether my understanding was right or wrong, to spend my life farming, growing rice and winter grain. This was the course upon which I settled. And what was this experience that changed my life? Forty years ago, when I was 25 years old, I was working for the Yokohama Customs Bureau in the Plant Inspection Division. My main job was to inspect incoming and outgoing plants for disease, carrying insects. I was fortunate to have a good deal of free time, which I spent in the research laboratory, carrying out investigations in my specialty of plant pathology. This laboratory was located next to Yamate Park and looked down on Yokohama Harbour from the bluff. Directly in front of the building was the Catholic Church, and to the cast was the Ferris Girls School. It was very quiet, all in all the perfect environment for carrying on research. The laboratory pathology researcher was Ichi Kurosawa. I had studied plant pathology under Makoto Okera, a teacher at Gifu Agricultural High School, and received guidance from Suhaiko Igata of the Okyama Prefecture Agricultural Testing Center. I was very fortunate to be a student of Professor Kurosawa. 
Although he remained largely unknown in the academic world, he is the man who isolated and raised in culture the fungus which causes bark and a disease in rice. He became the first to extract the plant growth hormone, jitrelin, from the fungus culture. This hormone, when a small amount is absorbed by the young rice plant, has the peculiar effect of causing the plant to grow abnormally tall. When given in excess, however, it brings about the opposite reaction, causing the plant's growth to be retarded. No one took much notice of this discovery in Japan, but overseas it became a topic of active research. Soon thereafter, an American made use of jitrelin in developing the seedless grape. I regarded Kurosawa-san as my own father and with his guidance built a dissection microscope and devoted myself to research on decay causing resin diseases in the trunk, branches and fruit of American and Japanese citrus trees. Looking through the microscope, I observed fungus cultures, crossbred various fungi and created new disease causing varieties. I was fascinated with my work. Since the job required deep, sustained concentration, there were times when I actually felt unconscious while working in the lab. This was also a time of youthful high spirits and I did not spend all of my time shut up in the research room. The place was the port city of Yokohama, no better spot to fool around and have a good time. It was during that time that the following episode occurred. Intent and with camera in hand, I was strolling by the wharf and caught sight of a beautiful woman. Thinking that she would make a great subject for a photograph, I asked her to pose for me. I helped her onto the deck of the foreign ship anchored there and asked her to look this way and that and took several pictures. She asked me to send her copies when the photos were ready. When I asked where to send them, she just said to Ofuna and left without mentioning her name. After I had developed the film, I showed the prints to a friend and asked if he recognized her. He gasped and said, That's Miko Takamene, the famous movie star. Right away, I sent 10 enlarged prints to her in Ofuna City. Before long, the prints autographed were returned in the mail. There was one missing, however. Thinking about this later, I realized that it was the close-up profile shot I had taken. It probably showed some wrinkles in her face. I was delighted and felt I had caught a glimpse into the feminine psyche. At other times, clumsy and awkward though I was, I frequented a dance hall in the Nankingai area. One time, I caught sight there of the popular singer, Noriko Abaya, and asked her to dance. I can never forget the feeling of that dance because I was so overwhelmed by her huge body that I could not even get my arm around her waist. In any event, I was a very busy, very fortunate young man, spending my days in amazement at the world of nature revealed through the eyepiece of the microscope, struck by how similar this minute world was to the great world of the infinite universe. In the evening, either in or out of love, I played around and enjoyed myself. I believe it was this aimless life, coupled with fatigue from overwork, that finally led to fainting spells in the research room. The consequence of all this was that I contracted acute pneumonia and was placed in the pneumothorax treatment room on the top floor of the police hospital. It was winter and through a broken window, the wind blew swirls of snow around the room. It was warm beneath the covers, but my face was like ice. The nurse would check my temperature and be gone in an instant. As it was a private room, people hardly ever looked in. I felt I had been put out in the bitter cold and suddenly plunged into a world of solitude and loneliness. I found myself face to face with the fear of death. As I think about it now, it seems a useless fear, but at that time, I took it seriously. I was finally released from the hospital, but I could not pull myself out of my depression. In what had I placed my confidence until then? I had been unconcerned and content, but what was the nature of that complacency? I was in an agony of doubt about the nature of life and death. I could not sleep, could not apply myself to my work. In nightly wanderings about the bluff and beside the harbour, I could find no relief. One night, as I wandered, I collapsed in exhaustion on a hill overlooking the harbour, finally dozing against the trunk of a large tree. I lay there, neither asleep nor awake until dawn. I can still remember that it was the morning of the 15th of May. In a daze, I watched the harbour grow light, seeing the sunrise and yet somehow not seeing it. As the breeze blew up from below the bluff, the morning mist suddenly disappeared. Just at that moment, a night heron appeared, gave a sharp cry and flew away into the distance. I could hear the flapping of its wings. In an instant, all my doubts and the gloomy mist of my confusion vanished. Everything I had held in firm conviction, everything upon which I had ordinarily relied, was swept away with the wind. I felt that I understood just one thing. Without my thinking about them, words came from my mouth. In this world, there is nothing at all. I felt that I understood nothing. To understand nothing, in this sense, is to recognize the insufficiency of intellectual knowledge. I could see that all the concepts to which I had been clinging, the very notion of existence itself, were empty fabrications. My spirit became light and clear. I was dancing wildly for joy. I could hear the small birds chirping in the trees and see the distant waves glistening in the rising sun. The leaves danced, green and sparkling. 
I felt that this was truly heaven on earth. Everything that had possessed me, all the agonies, disappeared like dreams and illusions, and something one might call true nature stood revealed. I think it would safely be said that from the experience of that morning, my life changed completely. Despite the change, I remained at root, an average foolish man, and there has been no change in this from then to the present time. Seen from the outside, there is no more run-of-the-mill fellow than I, and there has been nothing extraordinary about my daily life. But the assurance that I know this one thing has not changed since that time. I have spent 30 years, 40 years, testing whether or not I have been mistaken, reflecting as I went along, but not once have I found evidence to oppose my conviction. That this realization in itself has great value does not mean that any special value is attached to me. I remain a simple man, just an old crow, so to speak. To the casual observer, I may seem either humble or arrogant. I tell the young people in my orchard again and again not to try to imitate me and it really angers me if there is someone who does not take this advice to heart. I ask, instead, that they simply live in nature and apply themselves to their daily work. No, there is nothing special about me, but what I have glimpsed is vastly important. Returning to the country On the day following this experience, May 16th, I reported to work and handed in my resignation on the spot. My superiors and friends were amazed. They had no idea what to make of this. They held a farewell party for me in a restaurant above the wharf, but the atmosphere was a bit peculiar. This young man, who had, until the previous day, gotten along well with everyone, who did not seem particularly dissatisfied with his work, who, on the contrary, had wholeheartedly dedicated himself to his research, had suddenly announced that he was quitting. And there I was, laughing happily. At that time, I addressed everyone as follows. On this side is the wharf. On the other side is Pier 4. If you think there is life on this side, then death is on the other. If you want to get rid of the idea of death, then you should rid yourself of the notion that there is life on this side. Life and death are one. When I said this, everyone became even more concerned about me. What's he saying? He must be out of his mind. They must have thought. They all saw me off with rueful faces. I was the only one who walked out briskly in high spirits. At that time, my roommate was extremely worried about me and suggested that I take a quiet rest, perhaps out on the Borso Peninsula. So I left. I would have gone anywhere at all if someone had asked me. I boarded the bus and rode for many miles gazing out at the checkered pattern of fields and small villages along the highway. At one stop, I saw a small sign which read, Utopia. I got off the bus there and set out in search of it. On the coast, there was a small inn and climbing the cliff, I found a place with a truly wonderful view. I stayed at the inn and spent the days dozing in the tall grasses overlooking the sea. It may have been a few days, a week or a month, but anyway, I stayed there for some time. As the days passed, my exhilaration dimmed, and I began to reflect on just what had happened. You could say I was finally coming to myself again. I went to Tokyo and stayed for a while, passing the days by walking in the park, stopping people on the street and talking to them, sleeping here and there. My friend was worried and came to see how I was getting along. Aren't you living in some dream world, some world of illusion? He asked. No, I replied. It's you who are living in the dream world. We both thought, I am right and you are in the dream world. When my friend turned to say goodbye, I answered with something like, Don't say goodbye. To part is just to part. My friend seemed to have given up hope. I left Tokyo, passed through the Kansai area, Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto, and came as far south as Kuyushu. I was enjoying myself, drifting from place to place with the breeze. I challenged a lot of people with my conviction that everything is meaningless and of no value, that everything returns to nothingness. But this was too much or too little for the everyday world to conceive. There was no communication whatsoever. I could only think of this concept of non-usefulness as being of great benefit to the world, and particularly the present world, which is moving so rapidly in the opposite direction. I actually wandered about with the intention of spreading the word throughout the whole country. The outcome was that wherever I went, I was ignored as an eccentric. So, I returned to my father's farm in the country. My father was growing tangerines at that time and I moved into a hut on the mountain and began to live a very simple, primitive life. I thought that if here, as a farmer of citrus and grain, I could actually demonstrate my realization, the world would recognize its truth. Instead of offering a hundred explanations, would not practicing this philosophy be the best way? My method of do-nothing farming began with this thought. It was in the 13th year of the present emperor's reign, 1938. I settled myself on the mountain and everything went well up to the time that my father entrusted me with the richly bearing trees in the orchard. 
he had already pruned the trees to the shape of sake cups so that the fruit could easily be harvested. When I left them abandoned in the state, the result was that the branches became intertwined, insects attacked the trees and the entire orchard withered away in no time. My conviction was that crops grow themselves and should not have to be grown. I had acted in the belief that everything should be left to take its natural course. But I found that if you apply this way of thinking all at once, before long things do not go so well. This is abandonment, not natural farming. My father was shocked. He said I must re-discipline myself, perhaps take a job somewhere and return when I had pulled myself back together. At that time, my father was headman of the village, and it was hard for the other members of the community to relate to his eccentric son, who obviously could not get along with the world, living as he did back in the mountains. Moreover, I disliked the prospect of military service, and as the war was becoming more and more violent, I decided to go along humbly with my father's wishes and take a job. At that time, technical specialists were few. The Kochi Prefecture Testing Station heard about me, and it came about that I was offered the post of Head Researcher of Disease and Insect Control. I imposed upon the kindness of Kochi Prefecture for almost eight years. At the testing centre, I became a supervisor in the Scientific Agriculture Division, and in research, devoted myself to increasing wartime food productivity. But actually, during those eight years, I was pondering the relationship between scientific and natural agriculture. Chemical agriculture, which utilizes the products of human intelligence, was reputed to be superior. The question, which was always in the back of my mind, was whether or not natural agriculture could stand up against modern science. When the war ended, I felt a fresh breeze of freedom, and with a sigh of relief, I returned to my home village to take up farming anew. Toward a do-nothing farming For 30 years, I lived only in my farming and had little contact with people outside my own community. During those years, I was heading in a straight line toward a do-nothing agricultural method. The usual way to go about developing a method is to ask, how about trying this or how about trying that, bringing in a variety of techniques one upon the other. This is modern agriculture and it only results in making the farmer busier. My way was opposite. I was aiming at a pleasant, natural way of farming. Farming as simply as possible within and in cooperation with the natural environment rather than the modern approach of applying increasingly complex techniques to remake nature entirely for the benefit of human beings, which results in making the work easier instead of harder. How about not doing this? How about not doing that? That was my way of thinking. I ultimately reached the conclusion that there was no need to plow, no need to apply fertilizer, no need to make compost, no need to use insecticide. When you get right down to it, there are few agricultural practices that are really necessary. The reason that man's improved techniques seem to be necessary is that the natural balance has been so badly upset beforehand by those same techniques that the land has become dependent on them. This line of reasoning not only applies to agriculture, but to other aspects of human society as well. Doctors and medicine become necessary when people create a sickly environment. Formal schooling has no intrinsic value, but becomes necessary when humanity creates a condition in which one must become educated just to get along. Before the end of the war, when I went up to the citrus orchard to practice what I then thought was natural farming, I did no pruning and left the orchard to itself. The branches became tangled, the trees were attacked by insects, and almost two acres of mandarin orange trees withered and died. From that time on, the question, what is the natural pattern, was always in my mind. In the process of arriving at the answer, I wiped out another 400 trees. Finally, I felt I could say with certainty, this is the natural pattern. To the extent that trees deviate from their natural form, pruning and insect extermination become necessary. To the extent that human society separates itself from a life close to nature, schooling becomes necessary. In nature, formal schooling has no function. In raising children, many parents make the same mistake I made in the orchard at first. For example, teaching music to children is as unnecessary as pruning orchard trees. A child's ear catches the music. The murmuring of a stream, the sound of frogs croaking by the river bank, the rustling of leaves in the forest, all these natural sounds are music, true music. However, when a variety of disturbing noises enters and confuses the ear, the child's pure, direct appreciation of music degenerates. If left to continue along that path, the child will be unable to hear the call of a bird or the sound of the wind as songs. That is why music education is thought to be beneficial to the child's development. The child, who is raised with an ear pure and clear, may not be able to play the popular tunes on the violin or the piano. But I do not think this has anything to do with the ability to hear true music or to sing. It is when the heart is filled with song that the child can be said to be musically gifted. Almost everyone thinks that nature is a good thing, but few can grasp the difference between natural and unnatural. If a single new bud is snipped off a fruit tree with a pair of scissors, it may bring about disorder that cannot be undone. 
when growing according to the natural form branches spread alternately from the trunk and the leaves receive sunlight uniformly if this sequence is disrupted the branches come into conflict lay one upon another and become tangled and the leaves wither in the places where the sun cannot penetrate insect damage develops if the tree is not pruned the following year more withered branches will appear human beings with their tampering do something wrong leave the damage unrepaired and when the adverse results accumulate work with all their might to correct them when the corrective actions appear to be successful they come to view these measures as splendid accomplishments people do this over and over again it is as if a fool were to stomp on and break the tiles of his roof then when it starts to rain and the ceiling begins to rot away he hastily climbs up to mend the damage rejoicing in the end that he has accomplished a miraculous solution it is the same with the scientist he pours over books night and day straining his eyes and becoming near sighted and if you wonder what on earth he has been working on all the time it is to become the inventor of eye glasses to correct near sightedness returning to the source learning against the long handle of my scythe i pause in my work in the orchard and gaze out at the mountains and the village below i wonder how it is that people's philosophies have come to spin faster than the changing seasons the path i have followed this natural way of farming which strikes most people as strange was first interpreted as a reaction against the advance and reckless development of science but all i have been doing farming out here in the country is trying to show that humanity knows nothing because the world is moving with such furious energy in the opposite direction it may appear that i have fallen behind the times but i firmly believe that the path i have been following is the most sensible one during the past few years the number of people interested in natural farming has grown considerably it seems that the limit of scientific development has been reached misgivings have begun to be felt and the time for reappraisal has arrived that which was viewed as primitive and backward is now unexpectedly seen to be far ahead of modern science this may seem strange at first but i do not find it strange at all i discussed this with kyoto university professor inuma recently a thousand years ago agriculture was practiced in japan without plowing and it was not until the tokugawa era 300 400 years ago that shallow cultivation was introduced deep plowing came to japan with western agriculture i said that in coping with the problems of the future the next generation would return to the non cultivation method to grow crops in an unplowed field may seem at first a regression to primitive agriculture but over the years this method has been shown in university laboratories and agricultural testing centers across the country to be the most simple efficient and up to date method of all although this way of farming this evolves modern science it now has come to stand in the forefront of modern agricultural development i presented this direct seeding non cultivation winter grain rice succession in agricultural journals 20 years ago from then on it appeared often in print and was introduced to the public at large on radio and television programs many times but nobody paid much attention to it now suddenly it is a completely different story you might say that natural farming has become the rage journalists professors and technical researchers are flocking to visit my fields and the huts up on the mountain different people see it from different points of view make their own interpretations and then leave one sees it as primitive another as backward someone else considers it the pinnacle of agricultural achievement and a fourth hails it as a breakthrough into the future in general people are only concerned with whether this kind of farming is an advance into the future or a revival of times past few are able to grasp correctly that natural farming arises from the unmoving and unchanging center of agricultural development to the extent that people separate themselves from nature they spin out further and further from the center at the same time a centripetal effect asserts itself and the desire to return to nature arises but if people merely become caught up in reacting moving to the left or to the right depending on conditions the result is only more activity the non moving point of origin which lies outside the realm of relativity is passed over unnoticed i believe that even returning to nature and anti pollution activities no matter how commendable are not moving toward a genuine solution if they are carried out solely in reaction to other development of the present age nature does not change although the way of viewing nature invariably changes from age to age no matter the age natural farming exists forever as the wellspring of agriculture on reason natural farming has not spread over the past 20 or 30 years this method of growing rice and winter grain has been tested over a wide range of climates and natural conditions almost every prefecture in japan has run tests comparing yields of direct seeding non cultivation with those of paddy rice growing and the usual rich and furrow rye and barley cultivation these tests have produced no evidence to contradict the universal applicability of natural farming therefore one may ask why this truth has not spread i think that one of the reasons is that the world has become so specialized that it has become impossible for people to grasp anything in its entirety 
For example, an expert in insect damage prevention from the Kochi Prefecture Testing Center came to inquire why there were so few rice leaf hoppers in my fields, even though I had not used insecticide. Upon investigating the habitat, the balance between insects and their natural enemies, the rate of spider propagation and so on, the leaf hoppers were found to be just as scarce in my fields as in the center's fields, which are sprayed countless times with a variety of deadly chemicals. The professor was also surprised to find that, while the harmful insects were few, their natural predators were far more numerous in my fields than in the sprayed fields. Then it dawned on him that the fields were being maintained in the state by means of a natural balance established among the various insect communities. He acknowledged that if my method were generally adopted, the problem of crop devastation by leaf hoppers could be solved. He then got into his car and returned to Kuchi. But if you ask whether or not the testing centers, soil fertility or crop specialists have come here, the answer is no. They have not. Moreover, if you were to suggest at a conference or gathering that this method, or rather non-method, be tried on a wide scale, it is my guess that the prefecture or research station would reply, sorry, it's too early for that. We must first carry out research from every possible angle before giving final approval. It would take years for a conclusion to be drawn. This sort of thing goes on all the time. Specialists and technicians from all over Japan have come to this farm. Seeing the fields from the standpoint of his own, especially every one of these researchers have found them at least satisfactory, if not remarkable. However, in the five or six years since the professor from the research station came to visit here, there have been few changes in Kochi Prefecture. This year, the Agricultural Department of Kinki University has set up a natural farming project team in which students of several different departments will come here to conduct investigations. This approach may be one step nearer, but I have a feeling that the next move may be two steps in the opposite direction. Self-styled experts often comment, the basic idea of the method is alright, but wouldn't it be more convenient to harvest by machine? Or wouldn't the yield be greater if you used fertilizer or pesticide in certain cases or at certain times? There are always those who try to mix natural and scientific farming. However, this way of thinking completely misses the point. The farmer who moves toward compromise can no longer criticize science at the fundamental level. Natural farming is gentle and easy and indicates a return to the source of farming. A single step away from the source can only lead one astray. Humanity does not know nature. Lately, I have been thinking that the point must be reached when scientists, politicians, artists, philosophers, men of religion and all those who work in the fields should gather here, gaze out over these fields and talk things over together. I think this is the kind of thing that must happen if people are to see beyond their specialities. Scientists think they can understand nature. That is the stand they take because they are convinced that they can understand nature. They are committed to investigating nature and putting it to use. However, I think an understanding of nature lies beyond the reach of human intelligence. I often tell the young people in the huts on the mountain who come here to help out and to learn about natural farming that anybody can see the trees up on the mountain. They can see the green of the leaves. They can see the rice plants. They think they know what green is. In contact with nature, morning and night, they sometimes come to think that they know nature. However, when they think they are beginning to understand nature, they can be sure that they are on the wrong track. Why is it impossible to know nature? That which is conceived to be nature is only the idea of nature arising in each person's mind. The ones who see true nature are infants. They see without thinking, straight and clear. If even the names of plants are known, a mandarin orange tree of the citrus family, a pine of the pine family, nature is not seen in its true form. An object seen in isolation from the whole is not the real thing. Specialists in various fields gather together and observe a stalk of rice. The insect disease specialist sees only insect damage. The specialist in plant nutrition considers only the plant's vigor. This is unavoidable as things are now. As an example, I told the gentleman from the research station when he was investigating the relation between rice leaf hoppers and spiders in my fields. Professor, since you are researching spiders, you are interested in only one among the many natural predators of the leaf hopper. This year, spiders appeared in great numbers, but last year, it was toads. Before that, it was frogs that predominated. There are countless variations. It is impossible for specialized research to grasp the role of a single predator at a certain time within the intricacy of insect interrelationships. There are seasons when the leaf hopper population is low because there are many spiders. There are times when a lot of rain falls and frogs cause the spiders to disappear, or when little rain falls and neither leaf hoppers nor frogs appear at all. Methods of insect control which ignore the relationships among the insects themselves are truly useless. Research on spiders and leaf hoppers must also consider the relation between frogs and spiders. When things have reached this point, a frog professor will also be needed. Experts on spiders and leaf hoppers 
another on rice and another expert on water management will all have to join the gathering. Furthermore, there are four or five different kinds of spiders in these fields. I remember a few years ago when somebody came rushing over to the house early one morning to ask me if I had covered my fields with a silk net or something. I could not imagine what he was talking about, so I hurried straight out to take a look. We had just finished harvesting the rice, and overnight, the rice stubble and low-lying grasses had become completely covered with spider webs, as though with silk. Waving and sparkling with the morning mist, it was a magnificent sight. The wonder of it is that when this happens, as it does only once in a great while, it only lasts for a day or two. If you look closely, there are several spiders in every square inch. They are so thick on the field that there is hardly any space between them. In a quarter acre, there must be how many thousands, how many millions. When you go to look at the field two or three days later, you see that strands of web several yards long have broken off and are waving about in the wind with five or six spiders clinging to each one. It is like when dandelion fluff or pinecone seeds are blown away in the wind. The young spiders cling to the strands and are sent sailing off in the sky. The spectacle is an amazing natural drama. Seeing this, you understand that poets and artists will also have to join in the gathering. When chemicals are put into a field, this is all destroyed in an instant. I once thought there would be nothing wrong with putting ashes from the fireplace onto the fields. Mr. Fukuoka makes compost of his wood ashes and other organic household wastes. He applies them to his small kitchen garden. The result was astounding. Two or three days later, the field was completely bare of spiders. The ashes had caused the strands of web to disintegrate. How many thousands of spiders fell victim to a single handful of this apparently harmless ash? Applying an insecticide is not simply a matter of eliminating the leaf hoppers together with their natural predators. Many other essential dramas of nature are affected. The phenomenon of these great swarms of spiders, which appear in the rice fields in the autumn and like escape artists vanish overnight, is still not understood. No one knows where they come from, how they survive the winter or where they go when they disappear. Therefore, the use of chemicals is not a problem for the entomologist alone. Philosophers, men of religion, artists and poets must also help to decide whether or not it is permissible to use chemicals in farming and what the results of using even organic fertilizers might be. We will harvest about 22 bushels, 1300 pounds of rice and 22 bushels of winter grain from each quarter acre of this land. If the harvest reaches 29 bushels, as it sometimes does, you might not be able to find a greater harvest if you search the whole country. Since advanced technology had nothing to do with growing this grain, it stands as a contradiction to the assumptions of modern science. Anyone who will come, see these fields and accept their testimony will feel deep misgivings over the question of whether or not humans know nature and of whether or not nature can be known within the confines of human understanding. The irony is that science has served only to show how small human knowledge is.